So that's pretty cool. Okay, so what helps us live longer? There is a lot of confusion about what can really increase our lifespan, but a group of scientists and doctors working with National Geographic studied four areas across the globe with the longest lifespans. So we're going to look at these in a second, but before we look at those, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the actual science stuff of it. And it is gonna get a little bit confusing. Don't get too overwhelmed. I'm gonna to try to break it down for you, but all of this stuff is just so interesting. So did you know only one in 5,000 people in America actually live to be a hung, a hung, oh my gosh, 100 years old? It's not that many. And humans are not actually programmed for longevity. So we genetically are designed to live long enough to procreate and then watch our children procreate. So basically, if you're a grandparent, you pretty much fulfilled biologically, genetically, um, your goals as a human, how we're programmed. So let's see. About 10 to 25 percent of our lifespan is determined by genes. This number changes depending on what study you read. Um, and then 75 to 90 percent of our lifespan is determined by our lifestyle. So genes are important, but maybe not as much as we think. Lifestyle is definitely important. What the research says. Now this is going to be where we get a little bit technical, but I think you guys can all handle it. So the older you get, the faster you age. So that means, you know, when you're younger, you're not aging as rapidly. But you know when like all of a sudden it's like your back hurts, your knees hurt, you've got digestive issues, you can't sleep, like everything starts to kind of fall apart all at once. That's because the older you get, you actually end up aging faster. So your cells start to deteriorate at a faster rate. And what we see here is there's something called telomeres. So what are they? Telomeres have been studied in longevity. Um, there's some research that believe they are the key to living a long life, if we can figure them out. Um, but there's still a lot of unknowns about telomeres. But basically, at the end of your chromosomes, you've got these little extra pieces of genes. And these don't code for anything. It's not, it doesn't tell your body anything to do, it doesn't tell if you've got blonde hair, or brown hair, or blue eyes, or green eyes, it doesn't give you any information. Basically, what these telomeres do is every time a cell divides, we lose a tiny little bit of that genetic code at the end. So these telomeres are just this extra code that can be lost without damaging our DNA. And when these telomeres, as your cell goes on and divides and divides and divides and divides, as you get older, you know, you produce lots of cells. Um, some are dying, some are growing, some are dividing. So these telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And when they reach a very specific length, that tells the cell, okay, you're done reproducing, you're, you're done, when you die, you die, that's it for you. And this is important, we need them, because that prevents this, our cells from just growing like crazy. Which if you think about cancer, that's what happens. What happens is these cells don't stop dividing, they keep going, keep going, keep going, and then you get a tumor. So the telomeres are important, they act like an intrinsic cell clock, they can say, all right, you know, you're dividing too much, you're done, prevents cancer. Of course, things go wrong and we get diseases like cancer. But the other side of it is that these telomeres can be harmful for our health when you think about it in the sense that, okay, it's a limited lifespan for this cell. So instead of the cell continuing to divide, especially cells that produce like the organs and the tissues that we need to keep us alive, there's a finite lifespan to that. If we could extend that lifespan, or if we could potentially make it unlimited, then our bodies, our organs, our cells, our tissues wouldn't degrade. And that's what happens when they get older, they, they degrade. So that's why the research is looking at these telomeres as potentially the key to longevity. But it's not the only key. <laughs> we also get in to the mitochondria. So if you remember from middle school or high school, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It converts all the food we eat, all the air we breathe into this ATP energy, which is then used by our bodies. So as the mitochondria, as we get older, as they continue to produce ATP, their function actually declines. 
the mitochondria themselves as they produce ATP end up producing other byproducts. And those compounds can be damaging, like hydrogen peroxide. And they can be damaging to the mitochondria and it can be damaging to some of our cells. So this actually ends up inhibiting some of their energy production over time. And when that production of ATP, the mitochondria isn't functioning optimally, so that production of ATP is decreased, it ends up starving the rest of our cells and our organs and our tissues of the energy that they need to survive. So another key to longevity is looking at this mitochondria and seeing, all right, what can we do to prevent it from being hurt? And how can we extend the lifespan of these mitochondria? So that's it for the super sciencey stuff. <laughs> so even though genes only contribute to 10 to 25% of our you know, longevity lifespan, they do make a difference. And then we've got this question of nature versus nurture. So your genes versus the environment. Your genetic code is not something that you can choose. You know, you're born from your parents, you get half your mom, half your dad comes together. It's kind of a crab shoot. We don't really know what's gonna happen. You might get certain traits from your mom, certain traits from your dad, and that's how your genetic code is. It's laid out. But what you can do is you can influence how specific genes are expressed and whether or not they get activated. So your genetic predisposition only counts for so much of the blame. You know, some people will say, well, my parents have high blood pressure, so I'm, I have high blood pressure. It is what it is. That's not necessarily true. Certain genes can be activated by your environmental exposures. So for example, if you have a gene for heart disease, your parents had heart disease, maybe your grandparents had heart disease, and you decide to eat the same foods that your parents grew up eating, your grandparents grew up eating, maybe it's a diet that's higher in inflammatory fats or high in sugar, or you're a steak and potatoes type of guy or girl, well, then there's a good chance that you're gonna activate those genes and it's gonna increase your risk of getting heart disease. However, if you decide, I don't want heart disease, I'm gonna break the cycle, I'm gonna exercise, I'm not gonna smoke, I'm gonna eat a super healthy diet, lots of plants, um, basically the opposite of what I grew up on, there's a good chance that you might not get heart disease. So you can kind of change how that gene gets expressed by the way that you eat, your lifestyle habits, and things like that. So what can we do, whoops, where is it? There we go. <laughs> what can we do to increase our longevity? What can you as a human being do? Because telomeres and mitochondria, that, yeah, that's really interesting, but it doesn't give us any insight on what we can do as humans to increase our lifespan. So this group of scientists that I mentioned earlier that worked with National Geographic, they traveled around the world and they researched the areas of the world where people had um, the most concentration of centenarians. So the people who are living the longest and not just one person here and there, but where is it concentrated that these people are living a really, really, really long time. And they came up with the blue zones. So the first is in Okinawa, Japan. We have Sardinia, Italy. Nicoya, Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, Nicaria, Greece. So these are the places that they found had the highest number of centenarians. In Okinawa, they had the oldest females. In Sardinia, it was the oldest males. This is one of the only places on earth that the males actually live just as long as the females. So it's really interesting. Um, but they also found a couple of other things that not only do they live long, but they live long, healthy lives. So these people are most likely um, to live a really long, healthy life, life <laughs> excuse me, and die in their sleep. So they're not dying of all of these health issues. They're not spending time in the hospital. They're not having huge medical bills. They're really living these long, healthy lives, which is pretty cool. So what these researchers found looking at these um, blue zones was that there was nine similar qualities in each of these zones that all of these people kind of um, adopted, these different habits. So we're gonna go deeply into each one of these, but basically they're called the power nine and it's moving naturally, having a purpose, downshifting, the 80% rule, a plant slant, wine at five, belonging, 
loved ones first, and finding your right tribe. So when I looked at these power nine, and there's been more studies done that have done um, more about specifically on diet versus specifically on lifestyle, but this was kind of the first general broad, um, what do all of these places have in common? And I was surprised to notice there's really not that much that has to do with food and exercise. A lot of it has to do with more social constructs, which is pretty cool because those are things we can change pretty easily, in my opinion. But look, thinking about that and thinking about the research, is that because food doesn't matter, exercise doesn't matter? Probably not. It's probably more just related to how the study was actually conducted. Um, and then it's also really hard to compare diets. Think about what you would have to do as a researcher to compare diets. You would be, you know, having to have everyone write down everything that they eat for a number of years and then analyzing all that data. It's a lot. It's a lot to do and it's probably too much um, for the scope of this study. So we don't see a lot of nutrition and exercise recommendations here, but we're going to go through them. So the first one is to move naturally. And what they found was that a lot of the people in these blue zones didn't actually exercise, not in the way that we typically think of exercise. They weren't going to the gym, they weren't going to CrossFit, they weren't running marathons, things like that. But they do remain active throughout their entire lives. So they actually live in environments that constantly nudge them or require them to move without really thinking about it. So in Sardinia, the houses are really close together um, and they had to most of them were second stories. So you had to climb up a lot of stairs. They didn't have a lot of, um, a lot of them didn't really drive, they didn't have cars. So they were walking to and from the grocery store, carrying their groceries all the way up the stairs. In Japan, the, um, they sit on the floor. So everyone was having to sit and get up from the floor multiple times, 30, 40 times a day. Uh, the, there's also, um, a big stressor on like having gardens and really growing your own garden and not having the modern um, conveniences of like all those electronic tools. They're doing more of like the sowing it themselves and plowing themselves and doing all that stuff. Same thing with the yard work and the housework. They're doing the raking, they're not using the leaf blowers. They're sweeping, you know, they're doing all this labor even when it comes down to the kitchen, when they're cooking, they are mixing the food. They're not putting it in an electric mixer. So they're doing things a little bit old school and that causes them to move more. For the Loma Linda, California population, um, that, is, that has a high concentration of Seventh-day Adventist, Adventists. And um, they, in their religion, go for a nature walk every single week. So that was built into their religion. So you can see they're not doing exercise in the way that we typically would think of exercise, but they are moving and they're moving their bodies naturally. Purpose, this was a big one. So finding your purpose has been a huge topic lately, um, at least for the younger generation. I can say that from <laughs> just my general life, <laughs> but this concept isn't really new. I think we're seeing it a lot now because COVID shook things up, um, especially kids getting out of college and trying to find jobs. So I think people are really trying to just find like, what's my purpose? What's gonna make me happy? How can I make that into my living? But this concept is something that's so ancient. So the Okinawans called it the Ikigai and the Nikoyans called it Plan de Vida. And these roughly translate to like, why I wake up in the morning. And for some sanitarians, their purpose was things like fishing or farming. Um, for others, it's simply just being like the great, great, great grandparent and taking care of those younger generations. So if you've ever thought about what your purpose is, um, there are some pretty cool strategies on how to figure it out if you're not sure. So you can, if you look at this little Venn diagram, it's things like you have what I love, what my strengths are, what I can get paid for, and what the world needs most. And as they all begin to overlap, the very, very center is your purpose. So this is a good exercise to do. If you're ever curious, you just start writing down, you know, what you love, what your strengths are and looking at where they all kind of connect. There's also a really great book. It's called Finding Your Dharma by Sahara Rose. That's all about 
Dharma is the Indian term for purpose, but it's all about finding your purpose. Um, and it's great. It helps you. It, they have meditations and other exercises that you can do if you're curious about what your purpose is. And if you feel like you haven't been living it, or maybe you feel like you have been living it, and that's great. So downshift. Everyone experiences stress at some point in their life. Even the people in the blue zones, they still have got some stress. <laughs> so stress leads to chronic inflammation. It lowers the immune system. It disrupts our hormone function. And it's overall associated with every major, major age-related disease. So stress is a huge issue and chronic stress is an even bigger issue. So all of the blue zones had routines or rituals to help reduce this stress. Many of us might have some type of stress relieving activity as well, but I think the big difference is that these, the people in the blue zones practice it regularly. So whether it's the people in Loma Linda who are taking walks at least once a week, or it's um, the Sardinians, they do happy hour. And um, let's see, the Akinawans, they pray, they take a few moments each day to remember their ancestors. So it's things like that. But whether they're doing it every day or once a week, it's routine. It happens. You don't skip it because things come up. It's what they do. And I think that's the big difference that we see. Next is the 80% rule. So I actually learned this when I was in college and I was so fascinated by it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, but it's a, there is an Okinawan term called harahabachibu. And basically it translates like roughly to eat until you're 80% full. But this is a 2,500 year old Confucian mantra. So it has been around for a very long time. And what the Okinawans do is before they sit down for a meal, they all chant harahabachibu, so that it reminds them to stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. If you remember, um, I think I was taught this in like middle school, but your stomach takes time to catch up to your brain or your brain takes time to catch up to your stomach. So as you're eating and you're eating, it tastes so good, you're eating pretty fast. Next thing you know, you've eaten this huge bowl of whatever it is and you feel stuffed, you are so full. That's because your brain takes a little bit to register that you're actually full. So when you keep eating, now you've just piled it on top and now you're to that point where you feel like you're going to burst. So eating till you're 80% full gives your brain that time to kind of catch up because you'll realize that you probably don't need any more. They also, the people in the blue zones also have um, some like tricks to help prevent overeating. A lot of times they eat their smallest meal late in the afternoon or in the early evening and they don't eat for the rest of the day. So their biggest meal will be like that midday meal or in the morning. And then dinner, which is typically American style, the biggest meal will be a lot smaller and it's not late at night. They also use things like smaller plates um, to prevent piling all this food on and they make their plates away from the table, put the food away, and then go sit down at the table and eat. So that helps prevent, you know, this family style of eating that we're used to in America, of just putting everything on the table and everyone can help themselves to endless portions. Um, that's, that doesn't happen in these blue zones. They are really very strict about not overeating. And there has been a lot of research on this and mild calorie restriction has been shown to improve longevity and increase lifespan. So this one is definitely scientifically backed. So now we've got the plant slant. There is technically no longevity diet. Researchers did notice a few common features of the diets in these blue zones, but nothing that they could say, you know, they didn't all follow the same diet. If you think about Japan, Japan definitely eats a lot different. They have different foods than somewhere like Italy or California. So what they did find was that there was beans, especially like fava, black beans, soybeans, and lentils, were very prominent in their diets, while meat, which interestingly enough, the most common meat eaten was pork, was eaten on average only five times per month, so like once a week. And the servings for meat were roughly three to four ounces, so that typical like card, deck of cards, that is a four, three to four ounce piece of meat. That would be the serving size. So when you think about America, um, Oops, I have that written twice, sorry. If you think about America, when we go to a restaurant, you can get like 
a huge steak, something that's like bigger than the size of your head. That's way bigger than the typical serving size, size of meat that these people are eating. And they're really not eating red meat. So another interesting thing was if you were on the talk last week where we talked about lectins, you're going to notice that the foods that are really common to all of these diets are the highest lectin foods. So these people, again, are cooking them properly. They're soaking them overnight, cooking them for a really long time, discarding the water, all that good stuff. But this just goes to show that foods high in lectins can have a place in a healthy diet. Another thing to mention is where they are purchasing their foods from. Most of these places uh, are not, except for Loma Linda, California, which is you know in the US, um, they're not in the US. And the US has one of the worst meat agricultural systems out. So these people, there's a higher chance that they're getting their meat from the farmer down the road or from the farmer's market, or it's organically grown or raised. And you know that animal has lived a healthier, happier life compared to what we typically eat here in the US. Um, on the same note, eating six servings of fruit and vegetables per day can cut down your risk of dying by about 26%. And following something like the Mediterranean diet reduced your risk of dying by 21%. So definitely this plant slant has some research to back it up. Um, again, you're always going to hear people saying like, I went keto, I'm doing great. And, you know, keto is the high fat, high meat diet. It is what it is. I think there's room for all different diets to be able to improve your longevity. But I think the big common thing that we noticed was this plant slant does tend to have a lot of anecdotal evidence for it. Next one is wine at five. So a lot of people living in the blue zones, except for um, the Loma Linda, California population because they don't drink, um, drank alcohol, alcohol moderately and regularly. So in Sardinia, they drink a special type of wine. It has the highest concentration of polyphenols than any other wine. And polyphenols are good things. We want them, they're antioxidants. Um, studies have shown consistently that moderate drinkers outlive non-drinkers. And a moderate drinking, moderate drinking consists of one glass a day for females and one to two glasses for males. So the best thing to drink is red wine because it does have those polyphenols. It has some resveratrol. Um, some wines are definitely better than others. Organic wine is going to be the best option. Um, people like to, a lot of times in Sardinia um, and Italy in general, people will make their own wines. So it's not just your conventional wine that you buy at the store. We're looking for something that's got some health benefits to it. And unfortunately, saving up all week and having 14 drinks on a Saturday does not have the same benefits as drinking one drink every day. So that binge drinking is very detrimental to your health, whereas one glass a day, that regular moderate drinking actually benefits your health. And what they found too was that these people are not drinking alone. Um, they're not drinking to cope with stressors. What they're doing is they're using it as a social event. They're drinking with their friends, they're drinking with family, they've got food around. It's more of like a positive experience um, compared to what drinking can be, which is more of like a coping me mechanism. Belong. This is a great one. So out of 263 centenarians, 258 belong to some faith-based community. Now, denomination does not seem to matter, but the research shows that attending a faith-based service at least four times per month, so about once a week, can add 14 to 14 years of life expectancy. That is a long time. That is a huge increase in life expectancy. So that's pretty cool. Um, they're not sure if it's due to like believing in something or if it's due to like having that community aspect of attending services, but either way, being involved in some type of faith-based community is important for your health. And when we say faith-based, we don't mean like you have to go to church or you have to participate in um, Sabbat or whatever it is, but you can be spiritual. This could be things like meditating or attending 
moon circles or even attending a yoga class once a week. But having that commitment and that community around you is really important. Loved ones first. So family plays a really large role in the lives of centenarians and family structures are really common in the blue zones. So what they found was that any aging family member was really kept close to the home. They weren't, um, families didn't separate too much. They didn't live across you know, the country from one another. Um, they really kept them close to home or even in the home. And younger members helped to care for the older ones. That's technically like their standard way of life. So I think a lot of times in this culture, we tend to see like caring for your older family members as a little bit of a burden. It's very stressful. Whereas in the blue zones, caring for older family members was seen as a privilege. They really emphasize like the cultural significance and the wisdom of these elders. And the researchers found that caring for elders not only lowered disease and mortality rates of the older people, it also lowered the disease rates of the children in the home, which is pretty cool. Committing to a life partner can also add up to three years of your life, given that the relationship is a happy and healthy one. So not only putting your family first, but putting your significant other first as well. So when I was doing this research, a lot of the doctors agreed that their number one recommendation for living a long and healthy life is to be in a committed romantic relationship or have family around. So that can help reduce your mortality risk by about 49%, which is really great. And then also we found that a good marriage can help to stave off diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and the flu. The science behind it is that it calms our stress response. Having a loving relationship can improve our HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal glands, and it helps kind of stave off that fight or flight response. We're more in that rest digest response, which is beneficial for our health. And it helps boost the release of hormones such as like oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin, which also benefit our health. And the last of the nine is right tribe. So again, this kind of goes with belonging, but it's a common feature where all of the blue zones, people had lots of friends they had a good, healthy social circle. And these social circles participated in healthy behaviors. So I read some research that was really depressing. And basically it said that Americans used to have about three good friends. Now we're down to about one and a half good friends on average. That's so sad. So most of us have about one to maybe two, one and a half good friends in our life. Whereas the people in the blue zones, for example, the Okinawans, they are born into a group of five friends. It's called a Moai. And these, this friend group that you're literally born into, you're committed to each other for life. So when you have good fortune, you share that fortune. When bad things happen, you have a whole system of people behind you to rely on. There's also the saying that you are the five people you surround yourself with, and it's true. Research from the Framingham studies showed that smoking, obesity, happiness, and even loneliness are contagious. Your social network plays a huge significant role on your health behaviors. So also what was found is that it's not enough to stay in touch virtually. Face-to-face -face contact releases neurotransmitters and hormones that can improve our health. And that we don't, the same parts of our brain are not activated when we're seeing someone through a screen versus when we're seeing them in person. But looking at all of this research, the conclusion that I came to was that if you want to live a long and healthy life, you might want to start hanging out with those centenarians in these blue zones, because then you're going to end up adopting their behaviors and acting how they act, which will hopefully let you live long. <laughs> so lowering, I mean, building a strong support network of family and friends can actually lower your mortality rate by about 45%. And I think that it's really important when we think about COVID and what we've all gone through the past year to reach out to family, try to have as safe as possible that physical social connection, because it's important. We're kind of getting into this post-COVID phase now with the vaccines being out. Um, and it's important to take advantage of that. Humans need social interaction to survive. 
Um, if you look at the studies that they did with monkeys where they gave a baby monkey a fake mother that was like basically a cage that had milk that they could go to, or they gave the monkey a, again, a fake mother, but it was wrapped in cloth and it had no food and it was just like a comforting, soft, warm body. The baby monkey actually went to the warm, soft, fake mother without food for survival instead of going to the one that had milk. So it's very interesting, but humans need social interaction. It's very important. And here's a couple of additional habits that are linked to a longer life. So yes, we've got the power nine, but they're not the only things that we can do to increase our health. Sleeping well is really important. Sleep is critical for your health, and I can't stress this enough. Poor sleep results in hormone imbalances, it reduces our immune system, and it increases our risk for diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. So the optimal time to be asleep each night is between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. And that doesn't mean that you only sleep from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It just means that ideal sleeping time, we want to make sure that we're asleep so that we can be asleep from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And it's also really important that we aim for seven and a half hours of sleep a night. So we have REM cycles and they are in a 90 minute cycle. So every 90 minutes, you're going to go through a REM cycle and basically you're going through like a lighter sleep into a really, really deep sleep where you have those dreams. Then you kind of come out of it into like a lighter sleep as well. And your brain has different waves that are produced during these REM cycles. And we wanna get through a full cycle. So at the end of that cycle, when we're in that lighter sleep, it's easier for us to wake up. We're ready to go. And we want to have so many REM cycles. And if we wake up in the middle, we're going to be cranky. We're going to be groggy. And if we don't get enough, we're going to be cranky. We're going to be groggy. But if we get too much, it's actually the same effect. We might feel even more tired, be cranky, be groggy. So both sleeping too much and not enough can actually reduce our lifespans. Sleeping less than five hours a night or more than nine is not good for our health. So that 7.5 is really ideal. And then if you were to go more, it would be nine or six if you're trying to stick with that 90 minute cycle. And it's also important that we wake up and go to bed around the same time each day because that really helps balance our circadian rhythms in our bodies. A good thing to do is if you have the opportunity to, if your um, job and everything allows is to watch sunrise and watch sunset each night, that tends to be a really good way to balance your circadian rhythm. So next is volunteering. And when we look at volunteering, it's very important that it is selfless volunteering because that's it that will help increase your lifespan. If you volunteer from a place of I'm doing this for me because I want to, whether it's improve your health or um, because you have to get community service or whatever it is, that doesn't have the same health benefits as just doing something to help someone else. So volunteers, regular volunteers, have a 29% lower risk of diabetes, a 17% lower risk of inflammation, and spend 38% fewer nights in the hospital than non-volunteers. But again, they found that people who were volunteering for their own benefit, they did not have all of these benefits. So reducing mortality with volunteering is up to 40, it's between 22 and 44%, depending on how much you volunteer, and where that um, effort to volunteer is coming from, which is pretty cool. And then, of course, last but not least, I'm going to end with don't smoke. Smoking, we know, is linked to a variety of health problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, early death. You know, the list goes on and on and on and on. But if you do smoke, it's never too late to quit. It really isn't. If you're a current smoker, quitting can help increase your lifespan and reduce your risk for chronic disease. There are so many um, different ways to quit smoking now. It's something that I encourage every single person to do if they smoke. Even the jewels or the electronic cigarettes, those are not good for our health. They mess with your blood sugar regulation and can result in diabetes and things like that. So it's really important to make sure that if you want to prolong your lifespan, we're doing all the things that we can to not cut our life short at the very least, if that makes sense.
So now looking at this presentation, what areas of your life can you improve to increase your longevity? If anyone would like to ask any questions or has anything to um, comment on, feel free. But thank you guys for listening. Let's see, I've got some messages. Um, okay, if one wakes up at the end of one REM cycle and stay awake for a half hour, but then return to sleep for another several hours, does that count toward the seven hours? Um, no, we want it to be a continuous seven and a half hours. That's a good question though. So a lot of times it's hard because we tend, a lot of people wake up multiple times throughout the night. Ideally, you want to sleep for seven and a half straight hours. Every time you wake up, you kind of disrupt that sleep cycle. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've got for that. <laughs> Does anyone else have any good questions? What are your thoughts on whiskey? So alcohol is a tricky one um, in the sense that really the studies show like red wine is the way to go. That's the most, that's the healthiest option. Um, with liquor, you kind of run into to different issues because there's not really a benefit. You know, like at least red wine has the antioxidants, like whiskey doesn't really have that. So I am a proponent of saying red wine if you're looking for longevity. A lot of people tend to take that wine at five and they're like, oh, that means I can drink alcohol, that's great. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. The, the research is really pretty much focused on red wine. The other ones don't really have much of a benefit at all. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, uh, how about Pierre from the farm red grape juice? Red um, grape juice, there's Yes, it's gonna have resveratrol in it, but I believe the, from the farm pure grape juice without any added sugar or anything is probably fine. Juice is tricky because a lot of times when we buy it in the store, it's filled with sugar and it's not actually like juice juice. It's not like real true juice, but if you're literally juicing grapes, um, that should be fine. You should be able to get some of the benefits. There are extra benefits in wine I believe due to the fermentation process but I would say red grape juice if you're making it yourself and you're not adding any other like filler sugar anything like that that'll give you some of those good benefits but you could also just eat the grape and get the benefits from that as well and I agree loneliness is a really big problem especially right now with COVID Well, if anybody else wants to ask anything, you can, but if not, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions that I didn't get to answer, you can email me or you can message me on Instagram and I will definitely get back to you. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you everyone um, who came to the program today. We really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.